So we're continuing our series on the fruit of the Spirit. Quite appropriate, I hope, at this time of harvest. And there was a, um, a saying that came to mind, and this probably says more about me, a saying that came to mind when I thought about the topic. Because the topic this morning, there's actually two topics, are peace and, uh, or wait for it, no, wait for it, wait for it, patience. See what I did there? See what I did there? Peace and patience, right. But the phrase that came to mind, and again, it says more about me, is the phrase, hell is other people. Hell is other people. And it came to mind, and I was thinking, where, I know, I know, where is it from? Now, some of you may have never heard it. But I was thinking, where is that saying, hell is other people from? And uh, it comes from the French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre. And he wrote a play. It's not a very wholesome play. I haven't read the play, so I don't recommend reading it. But there's these characters in this play, in this afterlife, and they realise that hell for them is not torture, but is other people. And this is what one of them says at the end. So this is hell. I'd never have believed it. You remember all we were told about the torture chambers, the fire and brimstone, the burning marl, old wives' tales. There's no need for red hot pokers. Hell is other people. Now, the philosopher was denying that hell was a real place. It was actually, in his view, hell was other people. You'll be pleased to know I don't agree with all of his conclusions about hell. Scripture tells us things about it, and this isn't the time or the place to go into detail. Well, it might be the place, but it's not the time. But other people, hmm, do you know, I can kind of see his point. Now, I know you're looking at me saying, Rob, you miserable so-and-so. But I can see his point, although I would put it this way, if we're honest. Suffering is other people. Not hell, suffering is other people. Because today, in our journey through the fruit of the Spirit, I want us to be able to let the mask just fall away and to be honest with ourselves that life in Christian community, true community, will bring us a level of suffering, of burden because of others, other people. We have to lay aside some of our naivety and face facts. When we choose to follow Christ, when we enter into his kingdom, with his people, we don't suddenly develop the gift of living in perfect harmony with each other. Now, I'm speaking from personal experience here, so if your experience is different, amen. My experience, not so much. Because we're speaking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the gifts. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are things like Wisdom, the gift of healing, of miracles, and so on. We're not talking about the gifts this morning. We're talking about the fruit. These fruit are not miraculous gifts that they're given to us in the blink of an eye. Peace and patience. Do you remember the words of Jesus when he said, by their gifts you shall know them? Nope, neither do I, because he didn't say that. <laughs> I'm glad I got some shaking heads. By their fruit you shall know them. These are the words Jesus actually said. He was talking about some people that um, we hopefully will not aspire to. Jesus said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree does, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. You find that in Matthew 7. Or the words of John. 
to those who were waiting to be baptised by him for the wrong reasons. He said, you brood of vipers, very pleasant, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance, turning away from the wrong paths, brings fruit. When we follow Christ, when we're honest, when we're committed to our walk, the Holy Spirit will produce good fruit in our lives. And by this fruit, we should be known. It's interesting, isn't it? He doesn't say, by their miraculous gifts of healing, you will know them. By their miraculous gifts of prophecy, they will be known and recognisable. Which again points out something else that we could look into this morning, which we're not going to, is that these fantastic competences, these gifts, these abilities, do not necessarily mark you out as following Jesus. By their fruit, you will know them. It takes time, though, for this fruit to develop. None more so with the fruit of peace. And wait for it. I'll stop saying that patience and this fruit can only grow and develop in fullness and this is where it comes to pass with the words of Jean Paul Sartre it can only grow and develop in fullness when we come face to face with the reality and at times the suffering that is other people I can develop the fruit of peace and patience to perfection on my own Put me in a situation where that is tested with other people, then you see what Jesus meant. Paul knew this full well because he had to deal with this suffering of other people in church life. In fact, some of the, the, the word, most of the words he spilled were about the fact that people just couldn't get along for some reason. This suffering that happens in relationship. He writes this, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Do you know, that's not from the same letter that he writes about the fruit of the Spirit. The, just the letter is Galatians 5 when he's writing about the fruit of the Spirit. Here he's talking to a church in Ephesus. And notice he says, be patient. And at the end he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So that's why this morning we're looking at peace and patience. Because I think the two are, are quite, quite finely entwined peace. Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech on a march in Montgomery, just a, oh sorry, Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama, not Montgomery, uh, Montgomeryshire. Martin Luther King gave a speech in Montgomery and he's quoted as saying this, I come, remember he's come with this march of people, I come not to bring this old peace, which is merely the absence of tension, I come to bring a positive peace, which is the presence of justice and the kingdom of God. Peace is not merely the absence of something, but the presence of something. Peace is not simply the avoidance of conflict. Although, to be honest, it's a great place to start. It's like when you have to break up a fight and you separate the warring parties, and you keep them apart, you keep the peace. That is the old peace, as Martin Luther King would say. It resolves very little other than preventing bloodshed or animosity from breaking out. You separate the warring parties. And that can be a goal in itself in our broken world, but it is not a kingdom peace. Peace, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is an active attitude of peace, of making every effort to live in a right 
and harmonious relationship with each other while, and this is quite important, while at the same time not being willing to compromise on the essential truths of life with God. And this last point is also crucial to our understanding of peace. Peace is not complete appeasement. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German priest and he lived through the rise of the Nazis. Some of his colleagues went quietly about their priestly business, trying to ignore the obvious discrimination and eventual genocide that Hitler and his followers perpetrated. But not Bonhoeffer. He knew what real peace and real conflict could mean. He spoke out against Hitler. He even joined the resistance movement. Bonhoeffer, the German priest, could have made every effort to live in peace with the Third Reich, as many priests did. He could have stayed in a harmonious relationship with the leadership of Germany. But in doing so, he would have had to throw away so much, if not all, of what he knew to be true about God and God's plan for the world. He knew what real peace and real conflict could mean. And as many of you know, he was executed in April 1945. In order to live in harmony with Hitler, he would have had to sacrifice his peace with God and his peace with the world. Peace is not total appeasement. Peace, which is the fruit of the Spirit, starts with the peace that comes from living in a right relationship with God through Jesus. And it overflows to all our other relationships without compromising this peace with God. It is a costly peace. So how can we practice peace? How can we exercise that fruit in our relationships with each other? And it's here, I think, that patience comes in, in the pursuit of peace. Because sometimes there aren't immediate happy endings to conflict or disagreements. Even when you're right. I've noticed, even when you think you're right, sometimes the other party doesn't quite get that. Could be that you're wrong, but you know, even when you're right. People can be notoriously slow to change their character faults, even if we point them out every day. (laughs) Suffering, in all honesty, can be other people as well as ourselves. And Bonhoeffer defines this well. He brings the kind of quite grating words of John Paul Sartre and he brings it to the reality of Christian life. In fact, he uses slightly different words. He uses the words I would use, suffering is other people. Bonhoeffer writes this. The Christian, however, and remember he's talking about men and women, he just uses the term brother and man, but we'll we'll use that interchangeably. The Christian, however, must bear the burden of a brother or sister. He must suffer and endure the brother or sister. It is only when he is a burden that another person is really a brother and not merely an object to be manipulated. The burden of men was so heavy for God himself that he had to endure the cross. God verily bore the burden of men in the body of Jesus, but he bore them as a mother carries her child as a shepherd enfolds the lost lamb that has been found. God took men upon himself and they weighted him to the ground. But God remained with them and they with God. In bearing with men, God maintained fellowship with them. It was the law of Christ that was fulfilled in the cross. And Bonhoeffer finishes by saying, and Christians must share in this law patience, bearing with one another, suffering and enduring one another. Do you know what the word Paul Paul uses for patience? The word actually means, and I think it's quite quite helpful actually, because patience can be this nebulous concept. Oh, patience, how nice. 
It means long-tempered as opposed to short-tempered. How much damage could be avoided if I and if we could hold our temper just a little bit longer? Being long-tempered, long-suffering rather than short-tempered and short-suffering. Now, I want to leave us with some simple strategies that might help us develop patience. And if you're thinking I'm an expert in patience, I'm an expert in impatience. So I've used these strategies myself and hopefully they will be helpful to you. And these strategies, there's, there's many others, but these are the ones I've used. View, wait and trust. So view, how you look. Not how you look, but how you look. How you see the other person or people is really important when you are suffering or enduring a brother or sister. Do you see them as God sees them? Because I found when you start to see that other person, that burden, as God sees them and as God sees you, it transforms how you deal with them. As a child of God, dearly loved, bought with a price beyond measure. As you have been forgiven much, Jesus would say in his parables and also in real life, so you will forgive. So the first strategy is try to see the other person as God sees them and as God sees you. Sometimes you've got to look at yourself and say, maybe I don't believe what God says about me, the good things that God sees in me. So view, change the way you look at them. The second, and this is one of the most important practical steps, really, really practical, wait. In the moment, wait, and in the long term, wait. So in the moment, there is something called the sacred pause, and it's across all kind of religious denominations and uh, philosophies. This idea, this sacred pause, the idea is you create distance between your emotions and your reactions. You know, we all try and control anger, The sacred pause allows you, in time, to be able to recognise you're angry, but not respond to that anger. If Jesus was angry, the Bible talks about not letting, not letting the sun go down on anger, recognising that actually it's there, it's an emotion. Sometimes we can't stop our emotions, we can't control them. Anger is actually a healthy response to a situation which you find unjust. It's just you might be wrong about that situation. So the sacred pause is you not responding, training yourself. And a, and a really simple way of doing that is just when you feel angry, try and recognise what it physically does to you because sometimes you can, you can physically feel it. It might be in there, it might be a tightening of, of your neck. There, there could be places where you physically feel this anger. And when you start to detect that, get used to just taking some breaths, get used to pause. These are kind of things we teach children, but we forget as adults. The sacred pause is building a time between the emotion and the reaction. And if you can do that, you can fill that time with either prayer or blessing. As Jesus said, what did he say? He said, bless those who persecute you. Well, I say try and bless those who make you really angry. Even if it's just in your mind when you're taking that distance between the anger and the reaction. And after you've blessed them, then react and see how that can change. It's amazing what can happen when you separate the emotions from the reaction. So that's the, the short-term wait. There is also a long-term wait. Because if you spend time in community with people, you recognize certain characteristics of them, shall we say? You've seen it in me and I've seen it in you. And some of those characteristics are wonderful. And some of those characteristics we know God is working on. The long-term view is give them time to change. Give them time to change. Don't get frustrated if, if it's the fourth or the fifth time it's happened. Give them the time. 
So the weight is not just the weight between emotions and reaction, it's also the weight between your expectations of people, and people should change, and the reality that they take a lot longer. Wait. So view them as God sees them. Wait in the moment and in the long term. And finally, and this is one that I return to time and time again, trust. Trust in God. Lots of the difficulties happen as lack of communication or things said about people that shouldn't have been said. Trust that God sees everything. He knows everything. There is nothing hidden that he doesn't know. There is nothing you have to sit down and say, God, do you know what? It wasn't actually like that. Because God knows what it was like. You don't need to tell him you can trust. He sees, he knows the situation. And trust that he's at work in our brother and sister's life as much as he's at work in ours. So we view them as God sees them. We're willing to wait in the moment and in the long term. And we trust that God is at work in their lives. The final strategy for peace, sorry, for patience, when we're looking for peace in harmonious relationships with one another, is a view of heaven, not a view of hell. Leave Jean-Paul Sartre to the side. When I started reading about him, I was like, actually, I don't really want to know much about this chap. The view of heaven is one of the biggest things that's helped me when it's comes to patience and peace, peace. The Christian faith has at its core the belief in a king, King Jesus, and a kingdom of which he is Lord. This kingdom will come in fullness at the end of time, and we who know Jesus will be, live with him in this kingdom, this heaven, forever. What will our disagreements look like in the light of that precious eternity. Something I've been telling myself. What will these things look like in the light of eternity? Those things we lost our patience over, those things that got us so worked up, will they seem so important then? These, those fellow brothers and sisters who have been redeemed, raised to be with Jesus, whatever we may look like, whatever that will be, as they walk beside us, as we discover the riches of eternity, and then we're thinking, they're the ones we got annoyed with because they didn't listen, or they were awkward, or I didn't listen, or I was awkward. They are our saints in heaven. Will all of that matter now that they have been sanctified, purified, forgiven, made perfect in Christ? I think not, personally. Friends, Jean-Paul Sartre said, hell is other people. Well, I say heaven is other people, as well as suffering. Brothers and sisters in Christ made complete in him. If we could see that today, and don't worry, I'm not shouting at you, I'm reminding myself, if we could see that today, if we could only see the work that Christ is doing in the lives of those around us, perhaps we could let the fruit of the Spirit, peace and patience, have freer reign in our lives. Let's pray.